Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Mind Science, Mind Matters webcast. I'm Miriam Good, Director of Mind Science based here in San Antonio, Texas. We are a nonprofit that funds early career neuroscientists and educational events like this. If you'd like to learn more about us, please uh, don't hesitate to visit our website at www.mindscience.org. And really our goal is to give you trustworthy information and tools to help you realize the richer, more meaningful life we all want, especially during these trying times. So today's topic, I'm so excited about it. Today's topic is unique, the new science of human individuality based on Dr. David Linden's book of the same title, and it's available for sale today. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get an advanced copy. I ate it up. It was wonderful, intriguing, fascinating, a fun read. I loved it. Uh, so please avail yourself of that uh, opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Super, yes. super. Thank you, Dr. Linden. So as we get started, uh, you probably all know the Zoom uh, mantras now. If you want to say hi in the chat, go ahead and do that. But if you have a specific question, go ahead and enter it in the Q&A. Uh, that helps us stay a little more organized and on target. And as always, a link to tonight's talk will be provided to you early next week. And a link to down, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, here is a Zoom, I don't know, faux pas. Yeah, Somebody yeah. tried to call me and it distracted me. Yes. That's, these are the times we live in. <laughs> <laughs> but, if, but if you'd like to make a donation to support programs like this, just text UNIQUE to 210-864-9674. So let's go ahead and get started. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you and welcome Dr. David Linden and my co-moderator, Dr. Sean Guillory. David Linden is a professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University of Medicine. His laboratory has worked for many years on the cellular basis of memory storage, recovery of function after brain injury and more. He's the author of three best-selling books on the biology of behavior for a general audience, The Accidental Mind, The Compass of Pleasure, and Touch, The Science of Hand, Heart, and Mind which to date have been translated into 19 languages. He's appeared on the TED Radio Hour, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and many, many other media outlets. He is also a recipient of a Mind Science Foundation Research Award, and this is his third talk for Mind Science, and we always, always enjoy him. Uh, wish it could be live, but we're, we're so happy you could join us tonight, Dr. Linden. Uh, and then Sean Guillory is a former mind science intern, my first, uh, who in his words, had the absolute privilege of doing his PhD dissertation on the neuroscience of humor and laughter. And in his words, again, he's been enjoying the professional ride ever since. He currently builds automation robots, but sadly has not gotten any of them to laugh. So, Welcome, Dr. Linden. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to kick off with just a question on what motivated you to write this book? Well, before I answer your question, I'd like to thank you and Dr. Guillory and everyone at Mind Science Foundation for, uh, for having me tonight. It's always a pleasure to be here. I wish I could be uh, with you in the uh, in the uh, in the Alamo stable as uh, as God intends, and I wish I could be eating good Tex-Mex food tonight in San Antonio, uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, as as my people say, next year in Jerusalem. So next year in San Antonio. So the question about how I came to write this book uh, is actually kind of a funny one. Uh, about five years ago, I found myself single in midlife, and uh, as one does these days, I went online, in, in, in my case, it was to the website OkCupid, and I started reading uh, uh, 
people's profiles and they would say things like, well, you know, I'm uh, five foot seven, 130 pounds. I'm left-handed. I like white chocolate, but I don't like hoppy beer. I tend to sleep late uh, in the morning and I'm politically liberal. And, you know, I would read this obviously with the intention of trying to find someone that would be a good match that, uh, you know, maybe I want to chat with and, and have a date with. And parenthetically, this worked out. I actually met my wife on OkCupid. Oh, and very good. Married, uh, now for years. Her name's Dina and she's wonderful. Uh, but it also made me think about traits because really OkCupid or any dating site is a masterclass in human individuality. You, you hear all these traits listed and it starts a nerd like me wondering, well, how do these things come to be? How do you wind up being left-handed or heterosexual or to have this body mass index or to enjoy this food, but not that food? And so that was really the push that got me started. Interesting. And I guess with that, um, I'm guessing on even said dates or even the first questions that you get, knowing what your background is, one of the first things they're going to ask, uh, so Dr. Linden, is it nature versus nurture? Which one is it? Um, <laughs> and what would your typical reaction be to something, you know, said question being asked? Well, my, my reaction is this, you know, this phrase nature versus nurture is very popular. It's it's been around uh, more recently since about the middle of the 19th century to have its present meaning. Uh, and but but versions of it actually go back to old French 12th century. The idea has been around for for a long time, and I think it persists in part because it's just kind of fun to say and it's got a good rhythm and you can dance to it. It's like <laughs> if the gloves don't fit, you must quit. You know. <laughs> nature versus nurture. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's got that groove. Gotcha. Uh, the problem is that it's a, scientifically, it's a terrible expression. It really does not capture uh, uh, very, very much of, of human individuality. In some ways, it even is like explicitly wrong. And so here's the issue. So nature in this expression means heredity, what you inherit from your parents. I don't really have a problem with that, using nature to mean heredity of poetic language. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. versus nurture. Nurture is a problem because nurture means how your parents or how your parents and community raised you or failed to do so. And so the implication of the phrase nature versus nurture is that the things that make your individual traits that you didn't inherit genetically uh, are entirely the way your parents and your community raised you, nurture. But that's just not true. Uh, what we know is that we are impinged upon by a huge range of experiences. And by experiences, I don't just mean social experiences. And I just don't mean experiences that you can write into memory in your brain. But I mean everything from the diseases your mother fought off when she was carrying you in utero to the foods you ate when you were young to the ambient temperature and day length uh, when you were a baby, uh, all these sorts of things, to the bacteria that, that inhabit your gut, all of these things conspire to form you as an individual. So I would replace nurture with experience, meaning experience is considered as, as broadly as possible. And we'll talk a little bit about the details of that in just a moment. The other thing that, that I really like is the, is the versus. It's the idea that they're, they're, it's got to be one or the other, or it's got to be, if it's 60% of one, it's got to be 40% of the other. And there are several ways in which this is wrong. So uh, heredity and experience uh, don't just work in opposition. They can also uh, interact in interesting ways. So for example, if you inherit broken copies of the, the gene that you need to metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine. This is a genetic disease called phenylketonuria or PKU that they commonly screen for in newborns. Well, this disease is only a problem if 
you also have the experience of eating foods that have phenylalanine in them. If you never eat any phenylalanine, it doesn't matter if your gene to metabolize it is broken. So this is a, a this is a hereditary experience interaction that's not a versus. Similarly, imagine if you were fortunate enough to be born to be, say, quick and coordinated and good at sports. Well, then you're more likely to practice sports and play sports when you're growing up and get even better at sports. So in this case, uh, uh, heredity and experience aren't in opposition. As a matter of fact, they're reinforcing each other. And, and there are many examples of this. And then the last thing is that there's still something missing. So we have to, we have to answer the question about why is it that genetically identical twins, monozygotic twins, that have essentially exactly the same DNA, that grow together relying right next to each other in the womb, they're born and they're not really identical in either their bodies or their, their temperament, right? If you look at them carefully, there are differences. One might be fussy and one might be mellow. One might have a spleen that's 30% larger than the other or a liver that's 10% smaller than the other. They aren't really identical. So why does this happen if they got the same genes and they were lying right next to each other in the womb? Yeah. Well, the main reason is because the DNA is not a blueprint. It's not a precise wiring diagram that tells every cell in your body exactly where to go and what to do and in the nervous system what to connect to. Rather, it is a general set of instructions that says something like, hey, you group of neurons, about half of you, you know, grow, grow dorsal words in the brain, and then about half of you cross the midline and half of you don't. Well, you know, in one identical twin, maybe 40% of the neurons will cross the midline, and the other one, 60% will cross the midline. Another one, you know, in another one, if it's triplets, 50% might cross the midline. So the genome does not specify the wiring diagram of the brain or the structure of the body totally precisely. And as a consequence, there is this random element that comes into play. So if we are to replace the heinous term nature versus nurture, what I would replace it with is heredity interacting with experience filtered through the random nature of development, which isn't nearly as fun to say, yeah. uh, but is way more accurate uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, genetics. So what I'd like to do now is to talk a little bit about human traits as a way of trying to understand uh, individuality, sure. um, because some traits are entirely heritable. They're entirely determined by the genes you inherit. And some traits are entirely independent of the genes you inherit. But most have lie somewhere in the middle and have both heritable and experiential and random uh, components to them. So an example of a trait that has, uh, that is entirely heritable is earwax type. And uh, you may not know this, but everyone has either wet or uh, wet or dry earwax. And the kind of earwax you have is determined by variation in a single gene that has the exciting name ABCC11. And ABCC11 codes for a transporter that moves salts and waters across membrane. And uh, so if you get one variant, you have wet earwax, you have the other, you have dry earwax, it doesn't matter how your parents raised you, it doesn't matter what culture you're in, what foods you ate, where you grew up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's entirely heritable and it's determined by this one gene. So does that mean we can call ABCC11 the earwax type gene? Well, actually no, because ABCC11 isn't just there for earwax, right? This transporter is present in all kinds of tissue, not just in the cells that secrete earwax. It's present in all kinds of different places in your body. Some people think that in the breast, uh, the wet 
earwax variant is also confers a slightly higher risk of women uh, developing breast cancer, for example. So we should never talk about genes in terms of traits. We should only talk about them in terms of what they make, uh, the receptors, the structural proteins, uh, the enzymes, the uh, things like that. So even the even ABCC11 isn't just the wet earwax gene. And so, of course, what this means is that if you ever hear anybody talk about, oh, well, this is the aggression gene or the gay gene or the vote Republican gene, you can call bullshit <laughs> uh, because it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> All right. So at the one scale, we've got, we got earwax type, which is entirely heritable. At the other end of the scale, we've got a trait like speech accent. Now I'm not talking, when I say speech accent, I mean the kind of speech patterns that you develop from your community. I'm not talking about whether your voice is high or low or resonant or reedy or nasal, because those things do have heritable components. But the speech accent uh, that you have naturally is entirely dependent upon mimicking the speech of the people that you grew up with. Of course, you can actively change it later in life if, 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 uh, uh, if you really want to, but it is a trait that has no heritable component whatsoever. So you got earwax at one end of the scale and speech accent at the other end of the scale. And then those are actually really, really rare situations. Almost every other trait, whether it is a behavioral trait or a physical trait, falls in between. Let's take a, a, a trait that's really super easy to measure, which is height. Right. So height is a trait that is about 80 percent heritable. If you are fortunate enough to live in a wealthy country where people and you have enough to eat and you have access to to good health care. And so that's that's a pretty heritable trait. It's, it's actually one of the most uh, uh, heritable traits that we know. Uh, it turns out that if you go do a kind of study called a genome-wide association study, which seeks to discover genes that contribute to the trait of height, that there are over a thousand different genes that contribute to height. So even something really straightforward like height, there is no height gene. There is no one height gene or even a small group of height genes. Height is determined by the tiny summated interactions of over a thousand different genes. And some of them, when you look at them, they kind of make sense. Like they secrete cartilage or bone. You go, yeah, sure. I see why that's important for height. And then some of them you look at and you go, I don't understand why that would contribute to height. Mm -hmm. And it's still a mystery that, you know, one that we'll hopefully ultimately figure out that we haven't figured out yet. Does yeah. randomness come into play there as well? Randomness does come into play there. So identical twins aren't always exactly the same height. So that is the, the, the proof we have that it's, well, first of all, 80% isn't 100%, right? Yeah. Uh, but even at birth, identical twins aren't the same, always exactly the same height. And, and that can be a result of randomness uh, in development. Good question. And you talked in your book also, um, one thing, well, first of all, the idea that there isn't one gene for a certain trait was new to me. I wouldn't have thought that there were thousands of genes involved. I, I maybe would have thought five or one. Uh, but you also talked in the book about how different people tolerate heat. Right. I'll get to that in just a moment. Yeah, yeah I'm on my way there. So height in the United States is about 80% heritable. But if you look in impoverished populations like rural Bolivia or rural India, now height is only 50% heritable. Mm -hmm. Well, why would that be? The reason is because people can't live up to the genetic potential, their genetic potential for height, if they're always fighting off communicable illness, if they are, if they can't get enough nutrients in their diet. So generally speaking, there are a number of traits uh, where the heritability only holds for a certain population. And uh, if you are struggling and poor, then the degree of heritability is lower. And I think to me, there is a social and political lesson here. In other words, if we look at pro-social traits like height 
or intelligence, which also has this property of being more heritable in wealthier populations. To me, what this says is, if you want humanity to be better, then what you need your job one is to give everyone the opportunity to live up to their genetic potential for positive traits, wow. right? Wow. Well, I'm a socialist, but yeah. I, that is the, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the lesson. So let's think about another trait, uh, like a behavioral trait, like risk-taking. Uh, risk-taking is something that psychologists measure with, uh, with surveys. Mm -hmm. Risk-taking uh, has a heritability that's in the ballpark of about 40%, so significant, but not entirely heritable. And likewise, if you do a genome-wide association to discover genes that contribute to risk-taking, it's a very large number over a thousand genes contribute to risk-taking. So there is no single risk-taking gene. All right, now let's turn to Miriam's question, which is, which is really important, which has to do with what are some of the experiences that influence traits that, uh, that uh, are not things that we normally think about as experiences, that are experiences broadly considered. And uh, if you will indulge me, I'm gonna read a small section uh, from the book to, uh, to get at this. In December 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army invaded the tropics, rapidly overrunning opposition in the steamy colonial enclaves of British Malaya and Burma, Dutch Indonesia, French Indo Indochina, the American Philippines, as well as the Kingdom of Thailand. Those were heady days for the Japanese military as they routed, among others, the vaunted British Army. The Japanese enjoyed rapid and decisive military victories, and by March 1942, they stood at the frontier of India. However, all was not well among this tropical fighting force. One serious problem was that many Japanese soldiers were succumbing to heat stroke, rendering them temporarily unable to fight. When army doctors investigated, they found that the soldiers from the colder northern Japanese island of Hokkaido had a much higher incidence of heat stroke than their comrades in arms from the subtropical southern island of Kyushu. The reason was that the northern soldiers sweated less and so had reduced evaporative cooling, resulting in dangerously elevated core body temperatures and hot climates. Skin biopsies from the soldiers revealed that northern and southern soldiers have the same total number of sweat glands. These, by the way, are the eccrine sweat glands, which cover most of the body and secrete salt water. Upon more detailed inspection, doctors discovered that the southern soldiers had more eccrine sweat glands that received nerve fibers carrying sweat activating electrical signals from the temperature regulating region of the brain. These are the sweat glands that matter most for keeping your body's core cool on a cool, on a hot day. Now the classic genetic ex explanation for how this difference came about would be that over many generations, people living in Kyushu develop differences in their genes compared to those living in Hokkaido. These genetic differences would give rise to more innervated sweat glands and better tolerance of hot climates. And we'd be passed down to the offspring of Kyushu parents. If that were true, then you would imagine the children who were born in Hokkaido, but whose parents were from established Kyushu families would inherit Kyushu typical gene variants and so have large numbers of activated sweat glands. And conversely, you would expect that Kyushu born and raised babies of parents from long established Hokkaido families would have fewer activated sweat glands. That explanation turned out to be utterly wrong. Instead, the degree of sweat gland innervation is determined by the ambient temperature experienced in your first year and is then locked in for the rest of your life. If you're born in a cold place and you move to a hot place later in life, you're just out of luck. You'll carry your cold appropriate reduced sweating skin with you. However, if you stay in the tropics and have and raise children there, they will have more activated sweat glands and improved thermal regulation. So that's an example of experience broadly considered influencing a trait. The other example that I would like to talk about, which is relevant to today's COVID days uh, goes back to the pandemic flu of 1918, which many of us have been hearing about lately. Uh, one of the things that people discovered is that the women who were uh, uh, pregnant in the winter of 1918, 19, 
19, gave birth to children. And then as those children grew up, they had a fourfold higher incidence of developing schizophrenia or autism. Now, autism wasn't really understood as an incidence then, but we can look back and, and make that uh, analysis. Schizophrenia was well understood then. Uh, and uh, so the question then becomes, well, well, how could this happen? And we don't entirely know, but there are some uh, studies in mice from the Choi lab at, at MIT that show when a pregnant mother is fighting off infection, that her, her body secretes a immune modulating molecule called interleukin-17. Interleukin-17 can cross through the placenta into the circulation of the developing fetus where it binds interleukin-17 receptors in particular parts of the developing brain, uh, causing that brain to develop in an abnormal manner and uh, presumably increasing the incidence of schizophrenia and autism. Now, we don't know for women who are carrying children uh, and are fighting off COVID if there is a, uh, if there's a similar risk. Only time will tell uh, as, their children, uh, as their children grow up. Uh, a question popped up here. Does it matter what part of gestation this would take place in? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. And it turns out that it does. So uh, in, in the mice, it's got to be em right around embryonic day 14, 15. Mice are, are pregnant for, uh, for 21 days. Uh, so uh, there is almost certainly a critical period where it has to happen during pregnancy. So if COVID is a, a, a culprit uh, for, for this, uh, uh, it almost certainly will uh, will happen during a very particular, if, if the in, infection is fought off during a very particular phase of gestation. Mm -hmm. Good question. That's frightening. Um, so uh, I have a question for you. Why do you call humans the anti-pandas when it yeah. comes to food? Oh, I love this question. And, you know, I love it in part because it harkens back to OkCupid. Okay One of the things that was really striking about uh, looking at people's profiles on OkCupid okay, was how much people spent time talking about what foods they liked and didn't like. And I think in part, it's because everyone has very particular likes and dislikes about food. They're easy to talk about. I remember thinking, I don't know if this really matters about whether we're gonna get along as a couple if you like or don't like white chocolate, but you know, whatever, it's fine. So what I mean when I say we're the anti-pandas when it comes to food is uh, that pandas, you know, live, I mean, giant pandas, when I say this, they live in one particular location in Southern China in a bamboo forest, and they only eat bamboo. That's it, one food, bamboo. They don't get bamboo, they are out of luck. Humans, on the other hand, have managed to uh, thrive in ecological niches ranging from the Arctic to the tropics and everywhere in between by not being too picky about what we eat by being food generalists. Now, flavor, as we experience it from food, is a blended sensation. It comes from the five basic tastes on the tongue, salt, sour, sweet, uh, bitter, and umami. But those are very you know, basic sensations. And most of our experience of food comes through olfaction. Uh, through our sense of smell. And it's, it's rather remarkable that uh, people often go into the doctor and say, I've lost my sense of taste. And it turns out actually what they've done is they've lost their sense of smell. And when you think about it, this is remarkable. You never go to the doctor and say, doctor, I'm blind. And the doctor would say, well, no, actually you're deaf. You were just mistaken, <laughs> just took one sense or another, yeah. right? But because taste and cell are so blended in our experience and referred to the mouth, it's, easy, it's, it's easier to make mistakes about exactly about what's going on. Now, we are born as babies with certain very basic reactions to food. Like babies will reject a silicone nipple that's been, dip, that's been dipped in a bitter solution. They'll make the, young, the yuck face that's across cultural universities, 
the tongue thrust and they'll, and they'll push it out. Likewise, if you give them a silicone nipple that's coated with sugar solution, they love it, right? All babies all around the world do. Now these things get elaborated during adulthood, but when it comes to smells, there are almost no smells that we are born disliking. And any, anyone who's ever been a uh, parent to a young child knows that like babies will happily play with their poop, right? Even that odor that we consider foul, yeah. they have to learn that it's bad. They are not, they are not naturally uh, averse to it. There, there are a couple of odors that we're born averse to, and these are rotting meat odors that have the rather poetic names of putrescine and cadaverine, uh, the chemical names. But aside from that, we are, uh, we're really built to learn about our, uh, our food likes and dislikes, particularly from smells. And these things are almost entirely culturally constructed. And uh, I would like to read a really short reading about that as well. It has to do with wintergreen. One might imagine that the USA and the UK share a lot of cultural similarities, but there's some notable differences in cultural ideas about odors. One involves the odor of wintergreen, which in a sample of Americans published in 1978 was rated the very most pleasant of 24 odors tested. This ranking is in stark opposition to a 1966 survey in the UK in which wintergreen was ranked as one of the most unpleasant odors. While there are a few other examples like this, most odors are ranked similarly in the two countries. People in both countries tend to like jasmine, but dislike pyridine, which has a stale fishy smell. Is this because of the genetic differences in the odorant receptors between uh, these two populations, Americans and Brits? No, it's because of associative learning. In the USA, wintergreen is used in candies and gum, while in the UK, particularly maybe less so now, but, but more so in the 1950s and 60s, it was almost entirely used in medicines, which are rubbed on the skin for the relief of pain, sports creams, Bengay, Icy Hot, that sort of thing. The pure sensory experience of wintergreen odor is the same for both groups, but the learned associations and hence the emotional responses to the odor are completely different. Cultural ideas about odors can change and this change is not just an invention of our present trend chasing society. Uh, uh, Pliny the Elder writing in Rome during the first century uh, opined that the iris perfume of Corinth was extremely popular for a long time, but afterwards that of Sisychus, then vine flower scent made in Cyprus was preferred, but afterwards that from Adramidium and the scent of marjoram made in Kos, but afterwards quince blossom unguent. Being on trend with your Roman perfume was no easy task. Interestingly, these favored perfumes were the same for men and women who wore the same scents, a practice which would mostly continue in Europe for centuries. For example, George IV, who ruled England from 1820 to 1830, first encountered a scent on a visiting princess at a royal ball that he later adopted as his own favorite. But 50 years later, styles had changed and sweet floral blends were deemed exclusively feminine, while men adopted more woodsy scents. Although perfume companies might tell you otherwise, there's nothing intrinsically womanly about the smell of flowers. It's merely a cultural construction of the present moment aided by an unusually malleable olfactory system. And I might add the reason our olfactory system is unusually malleable is precisely so we can be anti-pandas and live anywhere in the world and get to like lots of different foods. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, big thing, which, you know, I, I, I read the entire book again, uh, unique, uh, the science of human individuality. It was fantastic. And uh, I believe it was either chapter seven or eight. Uh, you devoted a whole chapter in regards to race and genetics. Um, big topic, big topic throughout history. And it's usually one where, um, it's usually put out that there's, you know, even like a lot of fear of how 
the science and study of it can be used to, you know, potentially, not even just potentially, has been used to subjugate different people in different ways. Um, and there have been calls in terms of why even study it when you have, you know, one of the fathers of genetics um, having some, you know, pretty uh, uh, disgusting ideas. But, you know, the way that you put about in terms of like why to study, I'm not going to steal your thunder because I want you to talk about it. But the reasons that you put out to like still study it, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts both on, you know, things dealing with race and then why you think it should uh, still be studied when it could still be used, totally misrepresented, but still be used to um, affect certain people. So thank you. It's an important question. It is the last chapter of my book and it is the most controversial topic in the book. And you're absolutely right uh, that historically and even in the present day, there is a lot of uh, use, misuse of genetics uh, to support racist ideas. And so uh, we as a field, as biologists have to be cognizant of that, to uh, critique our forebears and to a whole present day work to an extraordinarily high standard. But I think the good news and something that I think people don't entirely know is that genetic, modern day genetic findings really from the last 10 years have devastated almost all the racist arguments. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you about how, uh, how that comes to be. So if you are uh, a racist, you know, if you're a KKK or a Proud Boy or whatever, you're probably a lot chanting about nature versus nurture or waving a sign, you know, about, about, about genome-wide association studies. But, you know, if asked, what you'll say is something like this. You'll say, you know, there are broad continent-based categories like Europeans and Asians and Africans that reflect the clear division of humanity into a small number of biologically distinct racial groups. These racial groups have remained fixed and unblended for tens of thousands of years, allowing genetic differences to accrue. And so, you know, you've probably heard people say things like, well, uh, there's actually way more genetic difference between any given racial, so-called racial group than uh, there is between racial groups. And, you, and in a way, well, that's true statistically, but I think everybody wonders, well, if that's the case, then how is it that I could look at photographs of people's faces, right? Without any other information, I'm not hearing their voice or seeing their clothes or there's any cultural information. And still I can guess, I can put them into a broad racial group that people tend to use. And I'm gonna be accurate maybe 70% of the time, 80% of the time, who knows, right? So like, there's gotta be something there so we can do that. Well, so the story is that these broad racial groups and racial groups as we use them are broad. We say black people, we say white people, we say Asians, you know, we don't, racial groups aren't like, you know, the Yanomano people of Venezuela. That's not what we mean when we say a racial group. We don't mean, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the Kalash people of Pakistan when we say yeah. a racial group, right? Yeah. There are these big categories. And so clearly there are a small number of traits that do allow us to categorize people, right? And they mostly have to do with skin color and hair color and things that we can see uh, on the outside. But how do these groups that we tend to define hold up? Well, the first thing to realize is that these groups aren't given by God, right? People make them up. And when you're in different places, they make them up differently. Like if you have to fill out the census form and declare your race in the US, it's not the same category as if you were doing it in England and not the same category mm -hmm. as if you were doing it in Brazil. So for example, on average, most people who self-identify as black in the US have about 20% European ancestry. In Brazil, you only call yourself black if you have nearly 100% African ancestry, right? And if you have 20% European ancestry, you would call yourself pardo or brown 
instead, right? Mm -hmm. So these categories are not biological categories. They're not given by God. They're categories that people make up. And historically, they're the categories that people make up when they want to steal your land and oppress you, right? Yeah. So, but what's the biology behind them? Like, if you go and look, you know, we can now look at genetic variations, single nucleotide polymorphisms across the genome and say, well, how do these things line up with our popular ideas of race? Do they, do they, do the races come out when you do that? And the answer is no, not at all. In other words, if you were to use genetic variation evidence, you would say that the Sardinians are their own race. You would say that there are eight, at least eight different races of black people because we all came from Africa and there's more variation because Homo sapiens started in Africa. We would call the Kalash people of Pakistan their own race, right? So the, it's very new that we know that this genetic variation does not correspond to the racial groups that people make up. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we know is that these groups that people love to talk about are not long-standing. People might say, oh, well, you know, I'm Swedish and I'm Swedish, you know, back for 40,000 years. I'm as purebred Swedish as you can get. Well, like nobody is, and it's not just for Swedish, it's for anything, right? So the idea that, 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 uh, uh, they like go back years and years, thousands of years. years and years, not true. So, so if you spit in a tube and send it <laughs> off, yeah, right, to one of these companies that pay, that call, that charges you a hundred bucks, right? They look back in time about 500 years to categories that everybody knows about, like before, mm. before a lot of colonialization. They say, oh, yes, you're 10% Irish, or you know, you're 30% West African, or you know, you're from this group in northern India. You know, the truth is they could go back further and say, all oh, right, well, okay, you know, you're a hit, you're you're 40% Hittite. Well, like <laughs> nobody would like that because it wouldn't have any cultural meaning for anybody, <laughs> right? You know, you can go back 200,000 years and say, you're all African. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right? Very good. So nearly every population alive today is the product of repeated mixing over many thousands of years. The analysis of ancient DNA shows that there's no mythical racial purity. People in the United States who self-identify as white on the census are a mixture of at least four ancient populations that thrived about 10,000 years ago. And those ancient populations were as different from one another as East Asians and Europeans are now. And the only reason we can say this is because it's only been in the last few years that we have gotten DNA from lots of ancient bones that has allowed us to make these kinds of statements. And so it is modern, contemporary genetics that allows you to build this anti-racist case. So another part of what, what racists will tell you is they'll say, well, you know, if you live in Africa, it's so easy to get food there that you don't have to be clever. Whereas if you live in Europe, it's hard to get food there. And that's what made Europeans clever and Africans less clever. Well, this is consummate horseshit, right? <laughs> because there is no one single environment of Africa that people are adapting to, and there's not one single environment of Europe that people are adapting to. Like Africa has seacoast and desert and forest and jungle and high mountains. And you know, likewise, Europe has all these, these different environments. There are changes that can happen to populations, but they happen locally. They don't happen all over a continent. Right. So we know, for example, that the people in Tibet who live at high altitude carry gene variants that allow them to function better in a low oxygen environment. And we know that other adaptations happen in other places where people live in high altitude, like in the Semian Mountains of Ethiopia. So it's not as if humans can't, groups of humans can't adapt to their environment but it's a local thing. It's not a continent wide thing. And it's not a thing that happens on the scale of what people claim for so-called racial groups. Yeah. Excellent. And then the final thing that, that uh, I would like to mention, do I, have, do I have time to talk for a couple more minutes? Absolutely. Yes. All right. 
The final thing that I would like to talk about is the idea that because a trait is heritable in, in different populations, that the difference between populations must be heritable as well. So let me give you an example. Body mass index is a highly heritable trait. It's in the ballpark of 70% heritable in the United States. Body mass index is also a highly heritable trait in France. On average, Americans are fatter than French people and have a higher body mass index. Is it because they're genetically different than French people? No, not at all. It's because they eat more fatty foods and exercise less, right? So people misunderstand this. The mere fact that a trait body mass index is heritable within one population or another says absolutely nothing about how the differences between populations arise. And I think that this is uh, an absolutely crucial distinction to, uh, to understand if you're going to think uh, about, uh, about race and about uh, particularly about behavioral characteristics in race. Wow. And I should mention that, you know, we now have, 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 have GWAS tests for all kinds of, of behavioral traits, and we're getting more and more all the time. And they've now enrolled, you know, 300,000 people, so they have some pretty good statistical power, right? And so, you know, we've got a list of a thousand genes that contribute to uh, the score you get on an IQ test, right? Yeah. Wait, well, so has anybody shown that those distribution of genes are different between races? No, not at all. Not for IQ, not for aggression, not for ADHD, not for any behavioral trait at all. So if some racist is going to claim that there are genetic differences in these behavioral traits, they're going to say this group is genetically more aggressive than this other group or genetically less intelligent than this other group, I say put up or shut up. <laughs> so yeah, what you're pretty much showing is the continued study of this seems to be the great weapon against all the pseudoscience around it. Yeah, I, you know, what I think is that is that uh, there are some folks with good intentions who get very nervous uh, talking about the heritability of traits. Mm -hmm. And they're like, whoa, no, 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 don't go there because like you're going the way of the colonials and you're going the way of the Nazis. This has all been so bad in the, in the past, just shut up about it. But first of all, I object to that scientifically. You can't just shut up about it. You gotta go where the science tells you, but you gotta, you gotta, hold, you gotta hold this work to a very high standard. And the good news is where the science is taking us lately is making the case ever stronger uh, against racism. Excellent. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Dr. Linden. And I would encourage everybody uh, to go out and buy this book, your chapter on race, on gender, on who you love. They're, they're just fabulous. Um, very thought provoking and very heartening. So thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go over to Q and A now. So if you have a question, yeah, go, go ahead and type it in the Q and A. Um, so we have a couple already. So first of all, sometimes <laughs> fairly average parents will have a highly intelligent child, as in a child prodigy. What role do genes play in this, or are there other factors? And are there other factors? Well, so uh, uh, the answer is, you know, it's complicated. If you go look, uh, if you go ask the question, like, what's the heritability of your IQ test score? Now, I'm not saying IQ, like, is the be all and end all in some perfect measure of intelligence. It's a pretty crude thing, but, you know, it's not meaningless either. If you look at the heritability of that, eh, you know, in a place that that in in you know um, among among uh, so for example among white people in the United States it's about fifty percent heritable. What that means is that that's only fifty percent. There's a lot left over for randomness and for non-genetic broad experiences. 
But uh, I think the other thing you know, to, to, to realize is just like when we were talking about, uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, height, right? And we said, well, all right, if you grow up in rural India and you don't get enough to eat and you're always fighting off diseases, you can't fulfill your genetic predisposition for height. Well, you know, if you grow up and you're always stressed out because you live in a, in, a, in a neighborhood that's full of crime and, and you're worried about the cops breaking down your door, or if you, uh, if you uh, don't get enough to eat, or if you don't have the ability to play and, and, and explore as a child, you're not gonna fulfill your genetic potential for intelligence either. So yeah, you know, what, what, what determines, uh, you know, uh, intelligence is, 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 is a mixture of things. Heredity is part of it, environment is part of it, randomness is part of it, and the environment includes your entire cultural milieu in which you, in which mm -hmm. you exist. Uh, it seems babies come with a certain temperament, fussy or calm, etc. Are genetics at play? Well, you know, in part yes and in part no. Right. So, so, you know, uh, what, what I can tell you is that there are situations where you have, where you have uh, genetically identical twins and you can still have one fessy or one calm. So clearly that argues that it's not entirely heritable. Fussiness or calmness, uh, like most traits, is going to, is going to be, is going to have the the tripartite influence, I realize I'm sounding like a broken record here, of randomness, heritability, and experience broadly considered. And here, here's a question. Do you have any dating advice? <laughs> <laughs> and related to that, do you think food preferences on dating profiles have anything deeper to do with compatibility genetically? Well, I think the, 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 the thing to realize about, about you know, is that uh, when people express their food preferences, it's not just what they like and don't like. Food is a cultural signifier as well. Like if you say, you know, I like, and then you mention some trendy food, like in part you're doing that because you're trying to telegraph, ooh, I like fancy restaurants and I pay attention to this and something that, that, that this is something that, uh, that matters to me. But so, there are many things that, that go into uh, uh, food preferences, most of which are uh, most of which are experiential, but some of which are heritable, right? Some people, if you go look uh, uh, carefully, there are some people who don't have any umami receptors on their tongue, or who have many fewer bitter receptors, or who have many more bitter receptors. Uh, people who have many bitter receptors are, are often very averse. They're the kinds of people who are usually very picky and only like very bland foods. But it also interacts with personality types. Some people who have strong bitter taste sensation, for example, nonetheless are, are very adventurous when they come to food because they also have the personality uh, trait of, of, of novelty seeking that goes along with it. So, oh my God, yeah, it does almost knock me over, but I love that because I want to try something new. So there are all kinds of interactions that, 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 uh, that go into food preferences, but, you know, we define ourselves culturally by, by, by the foods we like and dislike, you know, both as individuals and by groups, you know. If you go to Thailand, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't like to eat hot chilies. And it's not a genetic thing. I mean, keep in mind, chilies only came to Thailand after they were brought from the Americas. They don't even, they don't even grow there normally, right? You know, imagine Indian food without chilies. Imagine Thai mm. food without chilies. This is, no. this is what it was like, you know, before, <laughs> say, the 17th century or so when, when these foods were introduced uh, uh, from the Americas. But, you know, now you'd be hard pressed to find people from those parts of the world, you know, who grew up with that stuff, who don't just absolutely love it. Super, and here's, we have just a couple questions left. Can you tell us about epigenetics and whether there are any examples of this in humans? Well, so epigenetics just means uh, the, 
modification of, of, of the expression of genes. And that's something that happens in every living organism from plants to humans. What I think the questioner may be actually talking about is something called transgenerational epigenetics, yeah. meaning, and, and this is what, what gets said in the media as you can inherit your grandma's trauma. The idea that if someone in your in your ancestry had something really bad happen, that that doesn't change your, your DNA, but it changes the marks that sit on your DNA that, uh, that, that determine what genes are turned on or turned off in, uh, in any given tissue at any time. Now, the uh, transgenetic epige transgenerational epigenetic inheritance definitely happens in plants. And it definitely happens in worms, but I'm sad to say that every single paper I've read about it in humans, I found completely unconvincing. No. And so uh, I'm not ready to get on the bus of you can inherit your grandma's trauma or your grandma's anything else through marks uh, that are made on your, on, your, uh, on your DNA and passed down through two generations. Well, I would be happy not to inherit my grandmother's trauma. <laughs> <laughs> I have enough of my own. <laughs> so last question, laughter and humor are incredibly individual. Have you examined the division of heredity, experience, and randomness as applies to the individual experience of laughter and humor? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, so much of laughter, and, 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 and I, I defer to, to Dr. Guillory, who's really the expert, on this, but, but so much of laughter isn't so much about kind of what we find funny as it is about a social situation with other people who are around us and, and, and wanting to share that uh, with them. So, so laughter turns out to be a really complicated thing in that way, right? Because it's, uh, now, now in terms of like what people tend to find funny, it's, it's very culturally determined, but my recollection from some of the early twins uh, 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 raised apart studies of which, uh, uh, of which there have been a number uh, suggested that there was at least some heritable component to sense of humor. I don't know how well that has held up uh, over the years. This was a finding you know, from the 1980s. Uh, so I would defer to experts on this, but uh, uh, it's not entirely inconceivable to me that, that there might be a hereditary component, not so much for, you know, oh, like you have a dark sense of humor or, you know, you like this kind of joke or telling that kind of story, which I think, you, but, but, you know, are you the sort of person who laughs easily? Are you the sort of person who, who enjoys uh, uh, conveying a story that might be humorous in a social situation? That is the sort of thing where there could potentially be uh, a heritable component, but but I think it's pretty poorly understood. Is my is my uh, is my take? Yeah, that, that that does seem to be a case. It's just been uh, very little kind of just studied on it, and usually when it's studied, it is studied to um, more the evolutionary psychology story, where females are seen more as the uh, endures and the humor recipients where the male is uh, trying to, uh, connive is the wrong word, but you know, um, uh, trying to influence in terms of getting a mate. So that's usually when you're gonna hear it in terms of the um, maybe male and female side. And uh, I guess to kind of answer this, so again, it's an open field that's uh, certainly open for uh, people who want to study it more. And Shouldn't your humor rating be included in a dating app? See, this is where self-report would just fail miserably. No, but see, everybody thinks they're the funniest person. So if anything, if they rate their some five stars, I'd head in the other direction uh, versus someone <laughs> maybe a little more honest about themselves. So because uh, everybody oh, thinks that they're the funniest dude. The everyone world. rates themselves. Everyone thinks that they have a good sense of humor. Yeah. Everyone so thinks that they're a better than average driver. It's, yeah. Know. So <laughs> very good. Well, that's well, just, this that's is just being human. This is a great note to end on. Uh, Dr. Linden, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody go buy this book. Please. And if it's you'd fantastic. like to make a donation in support 
of this kind of programming, uh, text UNIQUE to 210-864-9674. That's up at the top of the chat. And of course, we're going to include it on all of our communications with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guillory. Again, thank you, Dr. Linden. And thank, thank you, you, audience, for joining us tonight. We'll yes, see you thank soon. Thank you to everyone who joined in. I deeply thank appreciate you. it. Thank yeah, you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care.